Hello everybody, my name is Carsten Schulze and I work at the Research and Development Department of SKIA Systems. I would like to thank the organizers of the Digital Optical Technologies 2021 conference for the opportunity to present our research slanted gratings with varying slant angle by localized reactive ion beam processing. This is bleeding edge work which was mostly done by my colleague David Stark who unfortunately cannot be here today of the day of recording. However, when you will be able to see this video, he will hopefully be fully recovered. Let me motivate our work a little bit. Slanted gratings can be used for augmented reality devices. Augmented reality means that the real world image is superimposed with additional information from a digital source such as navigation instructions by a routing system to guide you towards your goal. An augmented reality device consists of three main components. A light engine, which generates the digital image. A waveguide, which transfers the digital image towards the receiver, which is the third component. To get the, the light from the light engine into the waveguide and from the waveguide to the receiver, um, an in and out coupling system is necessary. This can be achieved by an in-coupling and out-coupling grating. To get most of the light in one direction from the light engine towards the receiver, it is beneficial to suppress diffraction orders which would go into the opposite direction. This can be achieved by tilting the grating. Also, it is uh, preferable to have a uniform illumination of the eye box. This can be achieved by varying the depth of the grating on the outcoupling side, because the outcoupling efficiency is dependent on the depth of the grating at each respective point. For easier manufacturing and um, production, uh, in and out coupling grating should be on one waveguide and should be possibly produced in one step. With this, it is necessary to achieve the different directions of the in coupling and out coupling grating, gratings in a single step. This can be done by ion beam etching. This means an ion beam source produces an ion beam towards a substrate which is masked with a metal mask um, on the points where no material should be, out, should be etched and is open, exposed to the iron beam on the points that should be etched. If the substrate is not perpendicular but tilted on a certain angle, the resulting edge pattern will also represent this tilting angle. If the substrate is tilted further, also the inclination of the grating will be higher. This is also illustrated in this sketch here. The blue regions are the mask. The gray region is the silicon dioxide quartz substrate. The iron beam hits under an angle of 45 degrees in this illustration. And the exposed regions are etched with a result as it can be seen in this SEM cross section. To achieve a high etching rate, a reactive ion beam etching process can be used. This is a vacuum process consisting of a plasma physical sputtering process and a chemical etching process. The sputtering process works as follows. Inert ions, for example argon, are produced in an ion beam source and accelerated with high energy towards the substrate surface. Once the ions hit the substrate surface, a collision cascade starts and uh, solid, state at solid state atoms in the substrate surface hit each other, transfer their impulse, and it is possible to have a resulting impulse vector with a component outside of the surface. If the energy is high enough, atoms and atom clusters from the substrate surface can be ejected into the vacuum. This process is highly directional due to the um, directional nature of the ion beam. To achieve a reactive ion beam etching process, we add a reactive species into the ion beam. This reactive species chemically reacts with the substrate atoms and forms volatile edge products. 
These edge products can then be pumped away from the vacuum system. The etching process can only start at regions which are left exposed by the mask. However, uh, the process itself is, uh, is isotropic, so it has no preferred direction. For the reactive ion beam etching process, we use the Skiatron 200 system. The Skiatron 200 system is a system which is used in semiconductor industry for thickness trimming and frequency trimming of surface and bulk acoustic wave filter devices. Ions are generated in an ion beam source and extracted toward the substrate surface. The ion beam itself is focused and the uh, diameter of the focus is much smaller than the wafer size. This means we have a localized ion beam etching process. By this, it is possible to achieve arbitrary edge patterns um, by controlling the speed of the motion of the wafer. The wafer is moved in front of the ion beam source in a, in a raster, in a meander type uh, path. When the wafer is moved fast, a low amount of material is removed, and when the wafer is moved slowly, a high amount of material is removed. With this, I would like to tell you something about our experiments. Inside our Skiatrim 200 system, we had a base pressure of 5 to the minus 7 millibar. With all the gases turned on, we had a process pressure of 5 to the minus 5 millibar. The ion beam was of Gaussian shape and the beam width, full width half maximum was about 5 millimeters. As feeding gases for the ion beam source, we used argon and fluorinated gases. Additionally, we used a background gas of oxygen, which is used to prevent the formation of fluorocarbon polymers, which are um, which have a bad impact on the etching process. The samples themselves uh, were created as follows. We used silicon wafers with 500 nanometers thermal oxide on top of which we deposited less than 100 nanometers of chromium. On top of the chromium, we deposited a photoresist layer. By direct laser lithography, we created the pattern into the resist. The pattern consisted of stripes with varying widths. Uh, minimum width was about five micrometers. After development of the photoresist, we transferred the, uh, the stripe pattern into the chromium to generate our hard mask. This was done by ion beam etching process and subsequently the resist was stripped. With this, we have our final samples uh, consisting of the silicon dioxide and the chromium hard mask. The sample area was 20 by 20 square millimeters. And with this, we got 12 samples on a six inch wafer. Once we had the samples ready, we could use them in the etching process for the reactive ion beam etching. And with this, I would like to show you the results of the etching processes. First of all, we want to use varying angles of incidence. This means we have to investigate how does the angle of incidence influence the edge rate. And as we expected, towards higher angle of incidence, the edge rate of both silicon dioxide and also the chromium increases. However, due to the chemical edge process with the fluorinated gases, the edge rate of chromium is much lower than the edge rate of the silicon dioxide. This is also what we want because we do not want to destroy the chromium hard mask by the ion beam etching process. Once we have both edge rates of silicon dioxide and chromium available, we can calculate the selectivity by, uh, by calculating the ratio of silicon dioxide edge rate to chromium edge rate. For all angles of incidence that we investigated, the edge rate is larger than or equal to three. This means we can edge as much as 300 nanometers for 100 nanometer of chromium hard mask. 
Please note that the large arrow bar towards the lower angle of incidence for the selectivity comes from the calculation method. The relative error for the chromium edge rate is, is high compared to the SiO2 edge rate. And if you multiply the relative error for the chromium edge rate with the high selectivity, you get this high error bar. But this is only an estimate of the maximum error. Since we want to trim with varying angle of incidence, we need to take into account this uh, change in edge rate across the sample area. For the processing, we decided that we start with a, a uniform edge target of 270 nanometer and we vary the angle of incidence from the bottom edge of 45 degree to the top edge of also 45 degree in the opposite direction. This is why it is marked here in blue and in shades of blue and red uh, with minus 45 and plus 45 degrees. Since we know the angle of incidence at each region of the sample, we can calculate how is the edge rate of the silicon dioxide on this region. When we know this rate map, we can then take this into account in the, in the trimming process. It means in the center of the sample, we have to edge much slower than at the top and bottom region. Please note that the edge rate itself is symmetrical for positive and negative angle of incidence. Let me show you an overview image by scanning electron microscopy. First of all, you can see that we successfully transferred the grating structure into the substrate. We investigated the structure size a little bit. In this region, the target was to have 10 micrometer period from, uh, from one uh, ridge to the next ridge. The ridges and the trenches should be equal in size of 5 micrometer, meaning we, we opted for a fill factor of 0.5. However, we did not fully achieve this. It has to be noted that the lithography process was not carefully optimized. What you can see from the cross-section image is that the flank angle near the center of the sample is nearly 90 degrees. We investigated this in further detail. First of all, we looked at the edge depth. Therefore, we also trimmed an unstructured sample where we could measure the edge depth with a reflectometer. As you can see in the cross-section of the sample, we did not get quite a uniform etching of, of 270 nanometers. The variation of edge depth is, about 10, is less than 10% of the target value of 270 nanometers. There is still room for optimization, but please keep in mind that in the region observed from minus 10 to plus 10 millimeters, the edge rate itself is varying more than 50%. This means we have significantly lower variation in the edge depth than it would be if we had not considered the variation in the edge rate. And we are pretty sure that we can improve this even further. We also compared it with the results from SEM cross-section images. Due to charging effects, we could not get a very high magnification. That is why that is also the reason why the arrow bars for the SEM cross-section image are so large. Because, uh, because the pixel size is relatively large in uh, uh, when you count it as nanometers. Additionally, we also investigated the sidewall inclination. First of all, it has to be noted that the sidewall inclination for those sidewalls facing away from the ion beam follows the direction of the ion beam, meaning with incidence from the top right to the bottom left, the inclination of the sidewall is the same direction. From the top left to the bottom right, the inclination of the sidewall follows also this direction. And for normal incidence, the sidewall inclination is nearly perpendicular. However, the inclination angles are not quite the same as the angle of incidence. We are not sure what is the origin for this and we hope that we can improve this even further. 
Furthermore, for those side walls which face the iron beam, we could not uh, see that those follow the direction of the iron beam. In contrast, we see a nearly perpendicular etching at those side walls, um, but we have not shown the images here. We are not quite sure what is the origin for this. Maybe it is due to the large structure size, which, to be honest, also doesn't qualify as a rating for optical wavelengths. Maybe it is also due to the mask geometry, which, as I mentioned already, has not been carefully optimized for this process yet. This is work that has to be done in the future. With this, let me conclude. I hope that I could show you that we produced slanted structures with varying slant angle by reactive ion beam training with the Skia Trim 200 system. This offers a highly flexible approach in the manufacturing of such slanted gratings and allows for the control of the slant angle and also for the edge depth within the grating. For the investigated system of SiO2 and chromium, we achieved a selectivity of larger than three for all angles of incidence up to an angle of 45 degrees. In the future, we hope that we can optimize the inclination angles with respect to the angle of incidence, that we can optimize the inclination angles of the side walls facing the iron beam, and we want to show that we can combine both varying the angle of incidence and also the edge depth across a single sample. I would like to thank Dr. Ingolf Mönch from the Helmholtz Zentrum Dresden-Rossendorf for providing the lithography and also the SEM images. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention.